A lot of this stuff develops early. However, what we don't really have a good handle on is how exactly these representations change uh, over life, over the first year. Um, and there's one really fascinating clue that I'll tell you about because it's, it's so neat. Okay, and that is something called perceptual narrowing. Okay, so here's the idea. Oops, okay, here's the idea. I'm going to show you a face and I want you to encode it. Here you go. Here's a face. Everybody got that face? Study it for a moment. Okay, I'm going to show you another monkey face in a moment and you're going to tell me is it same or different? How many people think that's the same monkey? How many people think different? How many people really don't know very well? Okay, it's hard. Okay, now let's try this. Okay, remember how hard that was. Now try this. Here's a face. Study it for a few seconds. Everybody got it? I'm going to show you another face, and you're going to say, is this next face same or different? Same or different? How many people found this a whole lot easier? Yeah. Okay. Here's the amazing thing. When you were six months old, you were better at that monkey task than you are right now. When you were six months old, you were good at both of those tasks. You have lost that ability since you were six months old. Your system has figured out that you need to know about human face differences and you don't need to know about monkey face differences. And so one of the paradoxical and fascinating things that happens over development in some domains is not just the refinement of abilities, but the loss of abilities that you don't need. That's called perceptual narrowing, because you have this general ability at six months, and then you lose it sometime between six months and a year. And fascinatingly, this is exactly what you see with learning of speech sounds in language. So infants are born uh, very soon after birth. You don't need to wait for, for six months for these studies distinguishing the sounds of not just ba versus pa, which are acoustically very similar, just a subtle little difference in the spectrogram, but we can all hear, you know, um, anyway, we can hear the difference between ba and pa. But there are, across all the languages of the world, there are lots of phonemes that have phonemic distinctions that I can't make because I don't speak those languages. But people who speak those languages can make these subtle differences that sound different to them. When you were six months old, you could discriminate all those sounds, all of the sounds in all of the world's language. Not six months, even younger, one or two months. I think I, think I forget how early this do, they've done this, but very, very early. You can discriminate all the speech sounds of all the world's languages. And then by the time you're six months old or a little older, you have lost the abilities to discriminate the sounds of Hindi and other languages that have these subtle distinctions that, um, that don't matter for your language, poof, they're gone, right? Also perceptual narrowing, similar phenomenon, deeply interesting, yeah? Okay, here's a study of um, human um, newborns looking at, uh, you show them these two faces here and you look at, um, you, look at you use this preferential looking, this habituation method to ask what counts as novel um, you train them on one, test them on the other, and you find that um, at six, nine, or uh, six months, nine months, or you test behaviorally in adults, they can distinguish the familiar from the novel, the one they've just habituated to from the novel face they haven't. Okay, so they can do this task here, um, and um, they can also discriminate monkey faces. Sorry, that didn't come out very well, but those are two different monkey faces here. With monkey faces, as adults, as you guys just saw, people are not very good at that. At nine months, you're not very good at it. But at six months, infants can discriminate those monkey faces. Okay? Perceptual narrowing. Quite amazing. Okay. Um, okay, so now, yes, go ahead. Question? I'm just going to ask if there's a way to, like, measure how different the faces are, because, like, to me, the two human faces look, look more different, but, like, is there a more objective way of determining, like, if you put, like, a woman's face or someone of a different race, that would obviously look more different? Or, like it's a great question. It's a great question. Maybe this is just kind of an easier task, because these stimuli are more different, right? But still, that would leave unaccounted for this part of the data. Why would you then lose that ability, right? So it's a good point you make, but notice that not all of the coolness of these findings can be accounted for that. 
because it's the e you know if this was easier, it's the easy one that's lost, right? Um, but generally, with this kind of experiment, it's it is important to deal with differences in the stimuli, and it's really hard when you're comparing um, faces to objects or even monkey faces to human faces. One of the things that's happened in other branches of the field in the last few years is that you can use um, deep neural networks trained in object recognition as a kind of proxy to, to kind of ask the network, are these things visually similar or not? So in lots of studies, for example, in my lab, we're using them more and more. Whenever we show, oh, some part of the brain can discriminate this from that, and we think it's for this interesting reason, not for this stimulus reason, we ask whether the, uh, the first few stages of a deep net can do that. So there, there are various approaches to this kind of question. I don't think they've all been perfectly handled in the early developmental stuff. This was 2002. They didn't have deep nets then or lots of other things. Um, but those are, those are good questions to ask about all of these kinds of experiments.